Okay, um, it's uh, just past uh, six o'clock Central Europe time, and it's great to have you all with us uh, today. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Frederick Michard, who tonight is going to be uh, talking on perioperative hemodynamic monitoring. And what's really exciting is just this catchphrase at the bottom, the devil is in the detail, because it's the part that always catches it out, doesn't it? So Frederick's really going to be diving into that subject for us and help us to understand how we can improve our hemodynamic uh, monitoring techniques and what we can look out for. So a very practical um, and insightful presentation. Um, at the end of, so when we start, it's uh, pre-recorded, so we don't have any hiccups with um, uh, internets, etc. So it's all a pre, this section is pre-recorded. And then we will join you live again at the end of this presentation just for Q&A. So if there are questions, please use your box um, and the typing and just type that in. Um, and we will do our best to answer them here. Um, or if we can't answer it straight away, we will come back to you um, as well. So I'd just like to um, formally welcome uh, Dr. Frederick Michar. Frederick is um, a critical care MD and PhD based in Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, he trained in Paris at the Paris University Hospitals and also in Boston. He has a background in both anesthesia and critical care from Harvard Medical School. He is known very well for his research work on pulse pressure variation with, only, with over 10,000 Google scholar citations. He's also known for his work in fluid res responsiveness, hemodynamic monitoring, and also lately, and I think this is very, very interesting for the future, his work in um, digital, the applications of digital medical devices and innovations around that area. So we're also looking forward to um, the future and what comes out um, from Frederick there. So um, what are we going to do now is we're just going to close down our microphones and cameras and we'll pass it over to the VT and we will come back to you again very shortly. Thank you. So hello everyone. My name is Frédéric Michel. I'm from Lausanne in Switzerland. So before I start, let me briefly disclose the fact I'm today leading a consulting and research company, Miko where we focus on digital innovations with medical applications. So as you know, pulse control methods or pulse wave analysis uh, methods are increasingly used for advanced hemodynamic monitoring in surgical and ICU patients, uh, but actually particularly uh, during eye surgery. And you have here two large studies showing that they actually used uh, by 70% or 75% of anesthesiologist when they decide to monitor cardiac output. We know uh, from many studies, we pool in these uh, meta-analysis published a few years ago in the British Journal of Anesthesia, that when anesthesiologists are using uh, pulse control techniques, they actually do a better job. Uh, when we pooled all these uh, studies together and focused on the impact on post-operative morbidity, we observed an odd ratio of 0.46 which means on average, a 54% reduction in postoperative morbidity. But clearly there is no perfect tool or perfect uh, strategy. All uh, approaches have uh, limitations. And very often the devil is actually in the details. First of all, the pressure transducer. So of course, I know you know, the pressure transducer has to be at the level of the heart. And that's usually the case. But I think there are still situations um, where actually we forget. And this is an example of uh, what's happening during a typical passive leg raise maneuver. If the pressure transducer is not attached to the patient, but uh, attached to an IV pole, which is still very often the case. As you can see, um, during the maneuver, the heart is no longer at the level of the pressure transducer. And so this is a very interesting study published last year, investigating the impact of this uh, pressure transducer level during a passive leg raise maneuver. So first of all, they quantify the average height or difference, distance difference, sorry, between the heart and between the pressure transducer during a typical passive leg raise maneuver. You see it was on average 18 centimeters. 
Then they measure cardiac output um, when the patient was uh, sitting in this uh, position. And instead of doing a passive leg raise maneuver that would inevitably modify cardiac output, at least in fluid responder patients, they simply elevated the pressure transducer by 18 centimeters to mimic uh, what's usually happening during a passive leg raise maneuver once again when the pressure transducer is attached to an IV pole. And then they measured cardiac output again and observed that actually cardiac output increased on average by 21%, which if you were doing a passive leg raise maneuver uh, would um, lead to the conclusion that the patient is fluid responsive. So just be very careful. As you can see, um, if the pressure transducer is not attached to the patient, but attached to an IV pole, uh, during a passive leg raise maneuver, you can uh, induce artificially wrong or false increase in cardiac output, which have nothing to do uh, with the volume status or the fluid status of your patient. So I think it's a first pretty important message. The second message I wanted to share with you is about the quality of the blood pressure waveform. Dumping, this is a pretty nice blood pressure waveform, but you know that it's not always the case. Sometimes it's uh, overdumped, and then it leads to an underestimation of systolic arterial pressure. It's usually pretty easy to recognize. Nurses are very familiar with that. Uh, the curve is flat, uh, the dichotic notch is becoming invisible. And it's very often uh, related to uh, kinking or partial obstruction of the catheter of the tubing. And so very often the problem is uh, solved, uh, settled just by flushing the system. Another issue which is actually uh, a little bit more challenging to deal with is underdumping. Underdumping is very common as well, and it's uh, responsible for an overestimation of systolic arterial pressure. And underdumping has been observed in around one third of uh, critically ill patients with a radial catheter. So it's very, very common, very often under detected, under diagnosed. And so here you see an example on the left of a typical underdumped waveform. And so there are ways to correct for underdumping. There are mechanical filters available on the market. I show you as an example of the acute dynamic device. And so by interposing, by uh, positioning this device between the catheter and the pressure transducer, and by progressively increasing the dumping of your monitoring system, you can normalize your blood pressure waveform, and you can also decrease uh, systolic arterial pressure and obtain numbers which are uh, much closer to what you would get from a non-invasive measurement uh, with a micro cap. Many years ago, I was invited to write an editorial in critical care medicine about pulse control analysis. And I already highlighted the fact that if we feed pulse control algorithm machines with abnormal arterial pressure waveforms, we may have the best pulse control algorithm on the planet we may end up with wrong stroke volume and cardiac output numbers or measurements. But to be honest, um, we don't know much about the real impact of underdumping on the cardiac output measurements. And so this is a very recent study not yet published by the team of Stefano Romagnoli from uh, Firenze in Italy. They selected 70 ICU patients in whom they identified and confirmed underdumping of the of the arterial pressure waveform. It was confirmed by a fast flush test and the Gardner method. And then they used the mechanical filter, the mechanical filter I showed you before, uh, to normalize the blood pressure waveform. They also used the new electronic filter developed by Vigon, which is part of uh, the Mosquer Up uh, cardiac output monitoring system that will automatically normalize uh, the blood pressure waveform as well. And so here are the results. So you see on the left hand side, you have the blood pressure, the systolic arterial pressure measured with a vagal cuff, non invasively. Then you have the systolic arterial pressure measured with a radial catheter. And once again, all these patients had, a, by definition, a, an underdumped uh, radial pressure waveform. And then you see the systolic arterial pressure values with the electronic filter or with the mechanical filter. 
And you can see that underdumping was uh, on average responsible for a 10 to 20% overestimation of systolic arterial pressure. They did the same with cardiac output. And I think this uh, sketch or graph uh, speaks for itself. So on the left-hand side, you have the cardiac output values uh, measured with uh, radial arterial pressure waveform, as it was. And then you have the measurement with the electronic filter and with the mechanical filter. And you see a, a dramatic change. In this patient population, underdumping was actually responsible for 80 to 90% overestimation of cardiac output which may obviously have uh, dramatic consequences on the hemodynamic management of these patients. Then in the study, they also compared cardiac output values measured with the electronic filter and the mechanical filter. Uh, this is the blonde altman comparison. And you can see a pretty good agreement with a percentage error of 30%, meaning these two uh, approaches were actually interchangeable uh, for measuring cardiac output. So well, this electronic filter is, I think, uh, pretty interesting. It is possible today to automatically uh, correct underdump arterial pressure waveform and then uh, improve the accuracy of pulse control methods. As a matter of fact, there is already one study published where they use this uh, electronic filter to monitor uh, cardiac output in patients in whom uh, obviously the arterial pressure waveform was underdumped. It's a study from uh, the group of Bern Circle that was published uh, two years ago in the European Journal of Anesthesiology. It's a comparison with uh, pulmonary artery thermodilution measurements, and they reported a pretty low percentage error and a pretty high concordance rate, which is uh, honestly uh, pretty uncommon for uh, most pulse control techniques. The second uh, aspect or issue I wanted to discuss with you is the protocol itself, the hemodynamic uh, monitoring protocol. Because uh, many of us are still using or still have the temptation to use the same goals or targets for all patients, a map above 65, a cardiac index above 2.5, and so on and so forth. I think we need to individualize uh, hemodynamic management. And first of all, blood pressure targets. We know from this uh, now very famous study published in the JAMA by the group of Emmanuel Fitcher that when we target during surgery, the systolic pressure that is a baseline personal systolic pressure of our patient, it is associated with a significant decrease in postoperative organ dysfunction as compared to a more classical approach where we simply react uh, when the blood pressure drops. So that's the first demonstration that individualizing blood pressure management may be useful to improve postoperative outcome. Uh, recently, the exact same approach or strategy has been used for cardiac output, once again by the team of Bern Sogol. In this study, they measure cardiac output values the day before surgery with a non-invasive system and use these individual values as targets uh, during the following surgery. And we're able to report, again, a significant improvement in postoperative outcome. You see a significant decrease in the number of postoperative, major postoperative complication and death at uh, 30 days. Actually, if we really want to individualize management, we can also try to assess uh, tissue perfusion. Uh, to do so, we can use uh, different tools, in particular, uh, video microscopic tools, which provide wonderful images of the microcirculation. You see here an example of uh, a patient with a pretty good uh, microcirculation. Here you obviously are a completely different scenario. So beautiful images, but as you know, to get this uh, information images, we need a specific tool. It's operator dependent, it's not continuous. And according to this uh, expert uh, panel paper published in Intensive Care Medicine a few years ago, if it's useful for research, that's not something we can use in our daily practice. There are multiple limitations, saliva, bubbles, loops, the light, is it too dark, is it too bright, and so on and so forth. So we need uh, practical solutions. 
And one of them could be to use the perfusion index. The perfusion index is, is actually displayed on most pulse oximeters. It's used as a quality indicator today for the PPG signal, but it's really a marker of the peripheral finger perfusion, of course. And so this is a, this is a recent study from the group of Nikolai Bankfos from Denmark. They assessed the peripheral perfusion index from a pulse oximeter during surgery, and they compared the values to postoperative outcome to major uh, postoperative complication to 30-day mortality. And as you can see, uh, patients who had the highest uh, major postoperative uh, morbidity incidence and the highest uh, postoperative mortality rate were also patients who had the lowest peripheral perfusion index during surgery. Interestingly, this study also showed that the association between uh, the peripheral perfusion index during surgery and postoperative outcome is much stronger than the association between intraoperative blood pressure and postoperative outcome. Suggesting once again, might be very interesting to monitor the peripheral perfusion index during surgery and possibly to optimize it. That's obviously the next step from a clinical research standpoint. Having said that, with a peripheral perfusion index, we know there are confounding factors that some patients have at baseline cold extremities um, when not a renal syndrome. We know it may be influenced by room temperature, which is uh, still uh, too low in many operating rooms. So what would be ideal is to have a central or internal perfusion index. And that's the concept uh, behind this new tool, which is a modified Foley catheter developed to monitor the urethral perfusion index. You see uh, the modified Foley catheter with a PPG sensor for the continuous monitoring of UPI. And it was uh, used in this uh, recent study from the group of Alexandre Justin, where they compared two different hemodynamic strategy, a classic one to a goal-directed free therapy approach, and were able to report a higher UPI, a higher, a better perfusion index uh, in patients uh, who uh, were part of the GDFT group. Well, the concept is, is the following. We all know there is some, sometimes a dissociation between blood pressure and cardiac output uh, on one hand and uh, microcirculation, tissue perfusion on the other. You have here an example of a patient who developed hypertension, systemic hypertension. He received norepinephrine. Then you see in red the mean arterial pressure uh, going up, but at the same time, this is tissue perfusion, in this case, assessed by UPI, the urethral perfusion index, going down. So obviously, these tools will help us or should help us uh, in the future to um, individualize blood pressure management and cardiac output management to ensure that what we do uh, is uh, always uh, an optimization of tissue perfusion and not always uh, simply a cosmetic normalization of variables such as uh, blood pressure and cardiac output. Last point I'd like to briefly discuss is the economic aspect. We all know today that rational fluid management or rational hemodynamic management may be useful to improve postoperative outcome, but still the adoption is poor. It has been shown by many surveys and audits uh, recently published in most uh, countries from Western Europe and uh, in the US. And so the economic aspect is very often uh, a strong uh, headwind. Our administration will never let us uh, buy uh, this hemodynamic equipment. It's far too expensive. So first of all, it's very important to understand that these uh, upfront costs have to be balanced with the potential savings associated with the decrease in complications. If you decrease the number of complications or the number of patients who develop complications, uh, it should be associated with a decrease in uh, hospital cost and hospital length of stay. In this regard, I developed a few years ago a very simple equation I call the Mercy equation that may give you the opportunity to uh, precisely assess the potential return on investment or the possible investment your hospital could make and to improve quality of care at no cost. Having said that, there are also today affordable hemodynamic monitoring solutions. You can use uh, disposable free pulse contour techniques, meaning you will simply actually uh, 
check the blood pressure waveform, slave the blood pressure waveform from the bedside, the regular bedside monitor into your hemodynamic monitor, and then you will be charged not anymore for a disposable sensor, but simply for using the software. And so that's a very basic comparison, assuming the monitor is around 30,000 and every sensor would cost around 300. I know there are differences between countries and between uh, systems, but it's just, uh, I think, a reasonable average estimation. And you can see that uh, if you use a disposable free sensor, it would be four times less expensive the first year for typical use in the OR, one case per weekday. And of course, if you project over a five years period, I mean, the savings are much more impressive. You can drop down the cost per patient around 20, 25 uh, dollars or euros per patient. It's going to be 40 times, 14 times, sorry, less expensive than with a classical system. And I would say even if you are lucky enough to work in a country or a hospital uh, without any uh, financial uh, difficulties, think about you, what you could do with uh, the savings. Uh, if you don't have to use any disposable, you can possibly buy a large number of uh, echo probes uh, pocket echo probes that uh, many of your uh, colleagues are probably interested in. So in conclusion, the quality of the blood pressure waveform is key to ensure accurate blood pressure and cardiac output monitoring. Overdumping is pretty easy to detect and to correct, most of the time just by flushing the line. And once again, nurses are very familiar with this issue and how to solve it. Underdumping is very common as well, roughly one third of critically ill patients. It's more difficult to uh, detect, uh, but today it can be detected and corrected automatically by uh, these new electronic filters. Personalized hemodynamic management is uh, likely the way to go. You can individualize blood pressure and cardiac output targets, but you can also assess tissue perfusion. And I shared with you uh, a few recent. Uh, papers and a concept uh, to um, assess easily, continuously, automatically uh, tissue perfusion at the bedside. And last but not least, be aware there are now affordable solutions for hemodynamic monitoring. It should logically help to improve the adoption of hemodynamic monitoring and optimization, particularly during high risk surgery. And it may help you as well to uh, offer um, focus uh, solutions. We all know that next to monitoring solutions, we also need uh, diagnostic tools and uh, ultrasounds are clearly indispensable today as well for uh, the uh, optimal hemodynamic assessment and management of surgical and critically ill patients. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, very much indeed, uh, Frederick. Uh, that was absolutely stunning. I particularly enjoyed um, the discussion around um, the need for personalised um, hemodynamic management. And what was interesting, certainly during the COVID, what's recently come out is the fact that we've been uh, looking at um, some mean arterial pressure targets um, between 60 and 62 millimetres of mercury rather than at 65, which is our traditional um, a target. Um, whilst we wait for uh, questions to come through, this is uh, your opportunity to um, ask questions. Please use the text there. Do you have any any thoughts, more thoughts on the personalization of, of hemodynamics, Frederick? Uh, I'm not going to repeat what I said in my uh, presentation. I think it's clearly uh, the way to go. We will probably see more and more studies uh, demonstrating the value of uh, individualized uh, hemodynamic management. Honestly, it makes a lot of sense to believe that, uh, uh, you know, there are not two patients alike. We don't have the same blood pressure at baseline. We don't have the same cardiac output. So that would be actually a surprise if we were able to optimize patients using the same targets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> we just need studies mm -hmm. um, demonstrating that indeed when uh, individualizing um, hemodynamic management, we do a better job than when using the, 
the same approach for all patients. So I think it's a matter of time. I shared in my presentation two studies already. The first one by um, Manu Futier, uh, published in the JAMA, showing that when we individualize blood pressure, uh, there are less uh, uh, complications after surgery. I also showed you a recent study from the group of Bern Sogol, showing that mm -hmm. when you individualize cardiac output, Mm -hmm. So uh, we can imagine that actually people are now designing studies where they do both uh, at the mm -hmm. same time. And, uh, and as I mentioned, there are also studies going on uh, targeting tissue perfusion, because that's probably actually the easiest way uh, to ultimately really individualize management is to assess um, during the procedure uh, tissue perfusion and then to adapt, because we can imagine that even for the same patient, uh, on day one or day four, um, the optimal blood pressure or the optimal cardiac output may be different. So I think also in the future, uh, we'll probably adapt to our uh, hemodynamic therapy uh, to the assessment, the continuous assessment of uh, tissue perfusion. But you understood that so far it's pretty challenging because there are a few tools available, but there are many for research, they are operator yes. dependent. So we need solutions like this uh, new UPI Mm -hmm. So that nurses can, can monitor uh, tissue perfusion as today they monitor blood pressure and heart rate continuously. So it's yeah. coming, slowly, yeah. but it's coming. And so, uh, and as you know, it takes time as well to, uh, to uh, conduct clinical studies and to publish them. But mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that in five years from now, it's going to be like, oh, of course, that's what we do. Because now there are uh, studies which have confirmed the value of um, uh, continuous uh, assessment of tissue perfusion and individualization of hemodynamic therapy. Thank you very much indeed. We got um, a question um, come from uh, Mauro. There are also several studies showing the benefit of hemodynamic uh, monitoring, where we optimize therapy also outside fluid balance and pressure management. I think that's just a statement um, from, from, from Mauro. Um, so that's quite um, interesting. Um, there's um... maybe what she meant is that there are other targets we can use, like uh, pulse pressure variation or mm -hmm. SVO2. Or I think, yeah, we have to to be honest and to say that what matters is to optimize, as I said, tissue perfusion. So today, to do so, we use uh, variables like blood flow, blood pressure. But we could use as well predictors of fluid responsiveness. We could use uh, markers of uh, global markers of tissue oxygenation like SVO2 or SCVO2. And so uh, would be would be a mistake to say there is just one way uh, to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that or if there is one way to do it, it's to individualize. But to individualize, we can look at different variables, use different tools. Uh, but what's key once again is to um, is to look at um, different patients uh, uh, differently, or at least to use different targets and to be able to adapt uh, to uh, individual needs at any time. Yeah, and, and thank you very much indeed. And that's exactly what Mauro has come back and just to to confirm that that question. Thank you, uh, Mauro. One of the things I know that you're passionate about is this um, idea of affordability and to make um, hemodynamic management available for every patient to remove that cost barrier um, about, about that. And I think it's a really powerful uh, demonstration that uh, you made of the, um, the cost of disposables um, as they mount up um, over the, uh, not just the months, but also uh, the years. What's your, uh, anything more that you can, you can say about that, um, how it makes you feel about the, the cost use you know, I, I basically spent the last uh, 10 years of my life trying to uh, convince my peers that uh, we should monitor hemodynamic variables to uh, better manage patients, um, to help clinicians conduct studies or publish their results or communicate their findings. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, the adoption is still pretty low. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often I meet colleagues who tell me, uh, we, we fully agree with what you said in your lecture, but we just, you know, don't have hemodynamic monitors in, uh, in mm -hmm. the UR. We have a few. We have mm -hmm. one, but we don't really use it because when you have just one, you know, it's not part of your habit. You don't even, you quickly forget uh, yes. you have one available. And mm -hmm. so actually, particularly when I give lectures in, I would say, middle income countries, um, most of the time they embrace this concept because once again, they make sense. 
uh, but they basically cannot afford these uh, or most of these techniques. The good news mm -hmm. is that there are now um, techniques which are really affordable, and that's what I try to demonstrate in the last part of my presentation. And I think it's really a blessing for patients uh, mm -hmm. because today, I'll give you just one example. In France, because it's, uh, I'm based in Switzerland, but I'm a French guy, as many of you uh, know or understood. And so in France, we have official guidelines from the French Society of Anesthesiology. They were published almost 10 years ago. They clearly recommend the use of hemodynamic monitoring systems uh, for high-risk surgical patients. And about a year ago, the French Society of Anesthesiologists uh, did an audit in uh, 23 uh, big academic centers in France to see if, uh, or to check that anesthesiologists were following their recommendations. The results were very disappointing. Less than 10% of iris surgical patients had their cardiac output and stroke volume monitored, and it was really the, the recommendation from, from this society. And in less than 2% of these patients, anesthesiologists were actually using the, the protocol they were recommending, mm -hmm. uh, which was mainly based on fluid optimization. So clearly there is a huge gap between what is recommended, what we know from studies, and you mm -hmm. know, it's not a couple of studies. Uh, last week, maybe some of you have seen in the British Journal of Anesthesia, a new meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials investigating the impact of hemodynamic monitoring and optimization and postoperative outcome. They pulled 75 randomized controlled trials. So mm -hmm. today there is clearly enough scientific evidence mm -hmm. to say that we do a better job when we monitor what we do, mm -hmm. but there is a huge gap between what's done at the bedside. Mm -hmm. And if it's the case in France, a country I know pretty well, I'm sure it's the case in many other countries. Yeah. And and once again, very often, I don't know if it's an excuse or if it's a real uh, challenge for many clinicians. I have the feeling it's, it's very often a real difficulty. They just cannot justify the acquisition of these tools because it's expensive or it's going to be expensive because mm -hmm. we'll have to buy these disposable sensors and maybe you will use it too much. And so, and so very often the hospital mm -hmm. is, or at least the administration is a bit concerned about this these um, expenses mm -hmm. and with, with, with the fact that they may not be able to limit also uh, the use of, of, of these tools. Yeah. So with this new solution, uh, mm -hmm. disposable free, um, you know, you can use, you can use the money as much as you like yeah. exactly for mm -hmm. an unlimited number of patients. It's not mm -hmm. going to increase at all mm -hmm. hospital costs. That's why I'm pretty confident. That's why actually I'm supporting this initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. Because once again, I think today the scientific evidence is clear. There are even guidelines. I mentioned the French Society, but I know there are guidelines in many other countries in Europe and beyond. And today, what's, what's actually uh, the issue is the, the, implementation. Mm -hmm. the implementation. And so, of course, if uh, these tools become affordable, I'm very optimistic that more and more patients will benefit from these uh, optimize hemodynamic management yeah no absolutely and and i think that people take away that at uh, that sentiment that um uh, data information drives therapy and therefore if you can access that that data the outcomes will improve um david greff um, asks a question um in your experience um why do you feel that um uh, more monitors are not frequent more frequently purchased is it just a question of price or is it about um they're not easy to use in daily practice um uh, where where could a technology like make uh, most care make a difference I, I think you know easy to use was an issue when we ease of use was an issue when we were using the swan or the doppler or esophageal doppler because of mm -hmm. hope is may move and you may have to reposition the Doppler probe and so on and so forth. But if, even the Doppler was already a significant step forward as compared to the SWAN. Uh, now we have pulse contour techniques. So to me, it's very simple. And that's what I often say. If you mm -hmm. decide to put an airline, a radial catheter, it's because you believe it's a risky procedure from a hemodynamic standpoint. Then mm -hmm. just connect the system able to analyze the waveform and mm -hmm. able to give you advanced hemodynamic variables. First of all, cardiac output, 
and yes. an estimation of, uh, uh, if not systemic vascular resistance, at least total vascular resistance, which in practice is basically the same. So you know, for example, when a patient is developing hypertension, you know if it's flow related or vascular tone related, and then you know if it makes sense to give vasopressors or to give fluid. And so um, I think today if clinicians do not use these techniques, it's, it's mainly, as I said, because the monitors are not available and yeah. they, they were until recently pretty expensive so they had to you know they had very often it was a trade-off you know because there are so many yeah. there are so many things we can monitor today yeah. um you know you have to so, make some choices yeah, there is some yeah. some competition and yeah. so you have to define what are your priorities clearly for cardiac surgery uh, it's a no-brainer. Uh, nobody would question the need, the fact that we need very often uh, hemodynamic monitoring. For non-cardiac surgery, it's less obvious because if you have, you know, GI procedure or orthopedic procedure and um, you have a pretty mm. good heart, um, okay, why should I monitor blood pressure uh, and cardiac output continuously? Today we have the evidence, as I said, and I thought I think the next step is clearly to have these tools available and to consider cardiac output as a new vital sign and to use these uh, advanced hemodynamic variables as today we monitor during surgery, heart rate and blood pressure and, and, and tidal CO2 and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah. So when it will become affordable and, and this, is, this is now possible, mm -hmm. I think we'll see a, a significant rise in adoption. Yeah, and you've got um, some support there as well coming in from Inner. Thank you very much indeed. One of the things as well I wanted to ask you about, I, I you, you, you talked about the, um, the the filters on the pressure signal, and you you identified the fact that you know thirty percent of uh, our arterial uh, pressures are under damped, and um, which can give us false readings. So we start to treat false readings uh, when it impacts. And obviously, you looked at um, the AccuDynamic, which is, if I understand correctly, is a manual technique where you can simply adjust the, the pressure wave until it reaches something that, you know, you consider to be um, acceptable. And then you've got um, an automated system in, in most care. And I know that you've done some research and you've worked into that. What gives you confidence in that filter technology that's available in most care? So the research, the, first of all, the research I shared with you is not from me, it's from uh, Stefano Romagnoli and his mm -hmm. team, it's from uh, Firenze in Italy. Mm -hmm. And I found their study extremely interesting, and, and Stefano gave me the permission to, to share with you the data. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, you saw like me, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really surprising to see that uh, uh, the impact of underdumping on cardiac output is not, is not mm -hmm. small, it's just, it's a sure. huge impact. And clearly, if you overestimate cardiac output by 80%, uh, you are going to, you know, SVR or TVR mm -hmm. is calculated from uh, the blood pressure and cardiac output. So it means that patients who have a very, who you believe have a very high cardiac output uh, mm -hmm. value, if it's not the case, you will clearly underestimate their vascular tone and you will probably give vasopressors too often or too mm -hmm. much. And this may have an impact because we know vasopressors are very good at uh, uh, improving or normalizing blood pressure, but also at uh, shutting down uh, mm -hmm. peripheral circulation. So we come back to the assessment of tissue perfusion and to the example yeah. I shared with you, you know, in these patients when they were giving uh, norepinephrine, which is very uh, useful to normalize or increase blood pressure. At the same time, actually, you can uh, significantly and dramatically decrease tissue perfusion. So all these um, concepts are combined. Uh, if you don't have, if you don't analyze a good quality blood pressure waveform, uh, you can end up giving vasopressor that actually your patients don't even need. And sure. then you may shut down the peripheral circulation and your patient may develop acute kidney injury or uh, mesenteric ischemia and so on and so forth. So these details, that's why, you know, the title of my lecture was uh, mm -hmm. the devil is, is, is in mm -hmm. the details. Because it looks like details, like the level of the pressure transducer or the checking the quality of the blood pressure signal. But at the end, actually, it could make a big difference, a huge difference um, in the way we are going to treat our patients and then probably in, uh, in the outcome, in patient outcome. Yeah, 
That was a great summary. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I could carry on chatting um, for the whole evening, but I know that we need to say thank you and um, goodbye. So I just want to, um, to, to wrap up this evening. Thank you so much indeed, Dr. Michal, for sharing your experience and knowledge. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. And on behalf of everybody um, here, we wish you well. So that's it for tonight. Um, I hope that um, you've enjoyed it. Um, keep looking out for next um, invitations to our webinars, and we hope you enjoy them soon. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Dear. Cheers, everybody. Bye.